bring our needs before you, God. We bring the needs of our congregation. We pray, Lord Jesus, that you would reach down right now, God, that you would touch those that are in the hospital that needing you to touch them in your precious name right now as we know you're able to do. Lord, for Gay Wilson, for this infection, for Ann Murphy as she continues to improve, Lord, for Sister Bell with medical procedures that are coming up. God, others who are sick among us in the name of Jesus right now, that you would touch each and every one of them. Lord, that as we call upon your name, we know that there's a God that cares. There's also a body of believers that are lifting us up. God, we pray for right now that you would touch right now as Dean is there with his mom. Lord, that you would touch her and strengthen her, God, as they fear she has pneumonia. We just pray that you would touch right now. God, we thank you and we praise you. We know that you're able to touch every one of these needs, Lord, as we lift each other up before you. You're a God that hears. You're a God that cares. You're a God that strengthens. You're a God that heals. We worship you and we praise you this morning. And we thank you, God, that your strength is with us and in us and for us in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah.
I want to speak with you for a few moments this morning about a worthless God. Now, when you hear a worthless God, there's something you need to recognize up on the screen. That little apostrophe right there changes everything. There are many people in the world that see God without that little apostrophe right there. Now, you know that that apostrophe makes it possessive. I am that worthless, and he is my God, you see. And now, there are many who look at, the, at, at our relationship with Jesus Christ, our relationship with God, and they say that it is worthless. <coughs> Have any of you noticed that not everyone agrees that Jesus Christ is the greatest thing and that God is the, loves us and that he sent a Savior to die for us? More and more in our society, people say, those who believe that, just, that's just a pipe dream. It's just, you're just trying to cover up for your weakness. You're just trying to compensate for this or that. You're, it's just a crutch. It's just an emotional tool. It's just something that you're using. Or it's, it's some power trying to manipulate you and control you. And that Christianity is the enemy of free thinking and an open mind. And... <coughs> I want to combat some of that this morning. Now, to combat it, sometimes you have to play the devil's advocate. Sometimes you have to look at it through the perspective of the other side. And I want us to understand something about our relationship with Jesus Christ. I'd like for you to turn with into John chapter 4 this morning. John chapter 4, and, and those of you who are familiar with Scripture, you'll already know that we're talking about the, the account of the woman at the well. And when you think about this account of the woman at the well, this is a, this is a woman whose life by much of society would be considered worthless. I don't think that I'm, I'm doing violence to the text to say that this was a woman who had been a, abused and used a woman who suffered in her sense of self-worth. Now, the reason I know that is that we're, we're talking about a woman, as we see, who was with a fifth man. Now, <coughs> either she has been abused and, 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 and used and thrown aside by four men and now being used by a fifth or she is a woman that has thrown the men aside. Either way, she's trying to have a, trying to either, if she's the woman who threw the men aside, then she is trying to find something to fill that emptiness, something that makes her have worth. And she's not found the right man because there is no man that can give you worth. There is no woman that can give you worth. God can give you worth. But no man or no woman can do that. And when we talk about self-esteem, there's no man that can give you esteem, ma'am. There's no woman, sir, that can give you esteem because it's self-esteem. It's self-worth. And they can do whatever they want, but they can't get... That is something you have to receive within yourself that you have to generate within yourself. It comes from within you. But you know, self-worth is self-worth is one of those things that is good, but it's not the all-inclusive goal and objective. As we look at this account, I want us to pick up in verse 1 of chapter 4 of John. The Pharisees heard that Jesus was gaining and baptizing more disciples than John. That is John the Baptist. And although, in fact, it was not Jesus who baptized, but his disciples. When the Lord learned of this, he left Judea and went back once more to Galilee. Now, he had to go through Samaria. It was the quickest way. So he came to a town in Samaria called Sychar, near the plot of ground Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, these folks would walk 20, 10, 15, 20 miles in a day. Walk, not drive, walk. And Jesus, tired as he was from the journey, sat down by the well, and it was about the sixth hour. 
When a Samaritan woman came to draw water and Jesus said to her, will you give me a drink? His disciples had gone into town to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, and you need to read in the, wait a minute. You're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. Maybe that doesn't mean anything to you, but you need to understand the dynamics of what was happening. The Samaritans were considered outcasts. Why? They had intermarried with the Canaanites. They had not continued to maintain themselves as Orthodox Jews, and so they were considered half-breeds. They were considered betrayers of the Jewish faith and, 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 and not considered real Jews by the Orthodox Jews. They were half-breeds. They were castaways. They were... She said, wait a minute. You are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. And, and then let's put that other word on there, woman. I'm not only a Samaritan, I'm a Samaritan woman. Now, we don't understand this as much. We used to more so than now, and thank God we don't. Because a lot of the prejudices that we so suffered under are so much better than they used to be. You don't see any white drinking fountains and black folk drinking fountains. You don't see that anymore. Thank God. Thank God that we're not there anymore. Doesn't mean we don't have some way to go, but thank God we're not where we've been. And I'm proud of this state. Everywhere I go in this country, you know, I, people seem to think that we're still back in the dark ages somewhere. And I look at this congregation, and you're a testimony to the fact that we're not where we used to be. Amen. We're not where we used to be. But they were still there. So she looks, and not only was there the stigma of her being a Samaritan, she was a Samaritan woman. And in their culture, women were more like chattel and property and owned by men. Thank God we're not there anymore either. And that women are not considered property. And it's hard to imagine you didn't used to even have the right to vote or own property. I mean, many people don't know that. Women couldn't own property. They could only own it through a husband or through a father or Whatever, they, it, it, there's so many things that we have come so far from. So she looks, she goes, wait a minute. And for you as a Jew to talk to a Samaritan woman, something's up. What are you up to? What do you want? How can you ask me for a drink? We could understand it a little bit in India. In India, there's a class system. And if you're a part of the outcast, you are not to touch anything of other, if you're an outcast, for instance, if you are dying of thirst and an outcast offered you a drink of water from their glass, you can't drink it because you cannot accept anything from an outcast. They are cursed. They are worthless. They are nothing. And they have no responsibility for them because you're an outcast because karma has chosen that's your judgment. And so I, should, I have no responsibility to help you and you're not supposed to touch my stuff and I'm certainly not going to touch yours. So this is the kind of atmosphere that we're looking at here. How can you ask me for a drink? For Jews do not associate with Samaritans. You, what are you... Jesus answered her in verse 10, If you knew the gift of God <coughs> and who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Wait a minute, you're the one that were asking me for a drink and you're telling me you're going to give me water to drink. Not literal water, not physical water, living water. Sir, the woman said, you have nothing to draw with and the well is deep. Where can you get this living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob who gave us this well and drank from it himself as did also his sons and his flocks and her herds? Jesus answered, everyone who drinks the water, this water will be thirsty again, but whoever drinks the water I give him will never thirst. Indeed, the water I give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. And he spoke of the Holy Spirit there becoming within us a well of living water. The woman said to him, sir... If you've got some water that makes me not have to keep coming back to this well and drag it up with a long rope and a bucket, hey, give me some of that. 
Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. See, we're so spoiled. How do we get water? Watch a few documentaries. There are many people in the world who have to walk miles to get water and have to carry it back on their head for hours. One thing that they did down at Mercy House one day is they gave every guy a gallon of water. And they said, now that's your water for the day. And they said, well, that's good. No, now you need to understand, that's your water to bathe. That's your water to drink. That's your water. That is your water for the day. That's it, one gallon of water. You get one gallon of water for the whole day to do everything you do with water. We waste more than that brushing our teeth. Water, so, and look, my grandmother... She was known, her nickname was Belle because there was a cartoon character of this woman that had big muscular arms and her, nick, her name was Belle. And so they nicknamed my grandmother Belle because she had big muscular arms. Why? They had a deep well. I've had to pull, one time it got clogged up with sand and we had to drop this, 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 this deal. It was a heavy, and, and, and you need, when you talk about a bucket in those kind of wells, you're talking about a bucket about this big around and about that long has a flap on the bottom then you have a heavy one with a flap and you drop it, it drives into the sand and then when you pick it up, it shuts and holds the sand and you pull. And look, it's like 60 feet down there. So she, was, she would pull water up with a pulley, dump it in to wash the clothes, to bathe the children, to cook with and whatever else. So she had big muscular arms. That's how she was nicknamed Belle and then she became Mama Lula Belle because her name was Lula and that's how she became Mama Lula Belle for her. <laughs> us as grandkids. But anyway... So that's this woman, except, you know, so she goes, look, if you could save me from having to do that every day for water and carry it back to the house, I'm, I'm in. And then Jesus does something. He said, well, go call your husband and come back. I have no husband, she replied. I don't have a husband. Jesus said to her, you're right. And when you say you have no husband, the fact is you've had five husbands. And the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said is very true. You don't have a husband. You know, the, the thing is we can't hear Jesus say this. All we can do is read what he said. So we don't know the intonation of his voice. We don't know how he sounded. It's kind of like text. Have you ever had one of those texts where you sent to someone and when you typed it, it seemed absolutely reasonable. But somehow in translation, well, all righty then. Somebody's upset. You have to be careful with text because you can't inflect in text to, now, that's, I guess that's what the emojis are for. I don't know. I'm not a big emoji fan. I don't know. But I believe Jesus said it with compassion. He said, you're right about the fact of you not having a husband. You've had five, and the man you're with now is not your husband. So you're right. Why do I say that? Because the woman didn't look at him in disgust and anger that he had spoken down to her and said, he said she said, Sir, verse 19, I can see that you're a prophet. I can see that you're a seer, that you're someone who sees and you understand and you perceive things. You're, you're a prophet. But then she does something interesting. She defends. She, she goes defensive at this point. Our, our father worshipped on this. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is Jerusalem. Why did she say that? Well, they, because they were considered such outcasts, they had created their own temple basically in Samaria. Because they felt so uncomfortable when they went to Jerusalem to worship at the temple there because they were so looked down upon. So they created their own place to kind of worship there. And so she's looking at him and going, yeah, yeah, I've got my problems, but you Jews have your problems too. You look down on us. Jesus declared, believe me, woman. And woman there is not a derogatory statement. Believe me, woman, a time is coming because Jesus even spoke to his mom at one point and said, woman, he, he, he was, this was not a disrespecting statement. You have to understand their culture. Woman, 
a time is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. Ma'am, I don't care whether you worship here or in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. What I'm really looking for, what God is really looking for, is for people to worship in spirit and in truth, whether you do it in Jerusalem or whether you do it in Samaria. Whether you go to this church or whether you go to that church, the question is, are you worshiping God in spirit and in truth? Are you genuine in your worship? God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know... Look, I, I know that one day the Messiah is going to come who's called the Christ and he's coming and when he comes, he will explain everything to us. Then Jesus declared to her, I who speak to you am he. I who speak to you am he. There are some who try to say that Jesus never declared himself to be the Messiah. But that's not true. On several occasions, Jesus said, if that's the person you're looking for, I'm him. I'm the Messiah. Now, let's go back to the, the, the Samaritan woman said, look, well, let's go and tell the rest of the story. He said, he said, look, I'm the one. I'm the one that you've been looking for. And uh, just then his disciple returned and were surprised to find him talking with a woman but no one asked, what do you want? Or why are you talking with her? Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? They came out of the town and made their way toward him. And many of them believed after what they heard and what they saw. This woman discovered the Messiah that day. Now, let's go back to this woman who defended herself who said, you Jews, you are Jew and I'm a Samaritan. How can you ask me to drink for Jews don't associate with Samaritans? Jesus said, if you only knew who I was. You see, the problem with many people today and about Christianity is they, they've heard of religion just like this Samaritan woman had heard about a coming Messiah. She had heard about this doctrine, this truth, <coughs> this Jewish faith. She had heard all of that but she didn't know the Messiah. She had not met the Messiah. She did not understand who the Messiah was, how he would be, but suddenly she's confronted with this, this person that transcends all of her religious ideas. And he comes with this love and this compassion and this sincerity, and she says, wait a minute, so you didn't tell me that to condemn me you just told me that to reveal to me that you see where I'm at. The problem is that we misunderstand what God is trying to say to us. And, and we misread what the Word of God is revealing to us. We tend to interpret it through the lens of our own self-image that is tainted by our thoughts and how God and others view us or how we view ourselves. The problem with many people is their own self-image, their own view of themselves tainted by their whole life of being told that they are worthless or no good or are they themselves struggling with their sense of self-worth and everything else. They are just, just <coughs> it's hard for them to accept and believe that God just unconditionally loves you. This lady, obviously there were conditions. And she had been through multiple failed relationships and, and she, she didn't trust, I guarantee you, she didn't trust men. Whether she had gotten rid of them or they had gotten rid of her, she didn't trust them because if she had trusted them, she wouldn't have gotten rid of five of them. And she certainly wouldn't trust them if she had been gotten rid of by five of them. So she did not trust men. And sometimes it's so hard for us to understand the kind of love that God offers us because we've never received that before. There are many women who marry dysfunctional men 
Many times because they've never had a good example of what a man should be in their father. And they don't understand what real love is about. I'm about to put a slide up here that's going to be disturbing. But it's how so many people, and this is an atheist view of God. If a parent constantly, consistently told their child that they were bad that they were always doing something wrong, that no matter what they did, they could never be good, that no matter how hard they tried, they could never do anything good without the parent's help. Would you call them a good parent? Think about that next time you pray to your father. Wow. I know when I first read this, I could feel the pain. I really could. I could feel the I didn't get mad, I, I just was grieved in my spirit because they have no idea of who my Jesus is. They have no idea of who my God is. Because you see, I was that worthless one. He is the worthless God. With that little apostrophe. You see, I was the one that was bound in my worthlessness and God came and gave me worth. You see, this is from the perspective, I have a little note at the bottom that I interjected there, from the perspective of an earthly parent finding significance and value by the dependence of their children upon them, whereas God gains no value from us or our dependence on Him. You see, there are parents who don't want their children to be self-sufficient because then they can't gain self-worth from the, the need of their children for them. <coughs> that's, that's a sick place, but it's just reality. It's like we don't want them to be able to do without us. I mean, I don't like it sometimes because, I mean, they can just go on with their life and never even call. I remember one time Lynette some, said something to me. She said, well, it's like they don't even need us anymore. I said, that's not a bad thing. You know, we're not having to pay all their bills. We're not having to take... They don't live with us anymore. You know, I mean, we want them to live with us because we want to hang out with them. We want to be with them. But God, th thank you that they don't have to live with us. Amen. They're grown up. They got their own homes. They have their own families. They have careers. They're taking care of their lives. They're paying their bills. They're going on with life. And some of you are going, oh, well, one of them. But anyway... But in a weird, twisted way, there are some parents who they're not really happy unless, well, their kids are struggling and having to be with them and take care of them because that gives them their self sense of self-worth. Understand something. There's no value we bring to God. He doesn't need us for who He is. So our dependence on him doesn't create any value. It's almost like God is this petty little God up there that needs our dependence on him to have any sense of self-worth. What God are you talking about? The God who reaches down and takes me out of the gutter and loves me in my worthlessness and becomes my God and redeems me. Now, now sometimes when you look at scripture though, let's be honest, it, it can sound a little tough. In John 15 verse 5, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. But then it says something here that's almost disturbing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. That's that inflection, you see. And that's the way a lot of people read it. God looks at me and says, you're nothing. You're nothing without me. Sometimes as parents, we can tell our children, you go on out there, you go on out try. you can't make it, you can't make it without me. I want them to make it without me. Okay, I want them to do good, but, that's, but, but here's the other thing. You see the God that I, I, I mean, I, I, I look at our children and, and I've told them, I've said, look, everything I've got, if you need it, I give it all. Everything. I'm not going to give it for you to do bad. I'm not going to give it for you to do evil. 
But I'll tell you what, if you're doing good and you're hurting, you're struggling and you're doing what is right, I, I, I would sacrifice everything I have for you. Everything. Because you mean more to me than any of that. Think about God. God loved us in our sinfulness, loved us where we were. And, and, and here's the deal. If, if, Bill, if, 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 if I was a partner with Bill Gates, we would be billionaires. Because his money and my money put together, we'd be billionaires. <laughs> we would be billionaires. Extract him from the equation, ah, we're not there. Let's just say we're a little short. Okay, you see, with God, I don't bring much of anything to the table. I mean, it looks at my self-worth. I remember reading years ago when, when, when President Trump was not President Trump, but when he was just Trump, and he had had some misfortune in some of his business dealings, and he was walking down the street, and he handed a man $5 who was hungry. And he said something, and I remember the quote, I just handed a man whose personal self-worth is $50 million more than me. Because he was in the rears $50 million in that particular situation. Now he turned it around, and I have to commend him, the man became successful. Yes, he's had some rough times, but somehow he's turned that around, became you know, prosperous and, and made great wealth. But you understand what he said? He said, I just gave a guy that's worth 50 million more than me because I'm negative 150 million at this point. So he's worth 50 million more than me. That's not our God. Everything is his. And so when we come to God it's, and God gives to us, what do we have to offer except ourselves back to him? And if you go on in that passage in John 15, and you go on down to verse 16, he says, you didn't choose me, but I have chosen you, and I've chosen you to go and bear much fruit and fruit that will remain. I have chosen you, and I'm going to help you be productive in this life. Amen. As a matter of fact, we read on in Philippians chapter 4, verse 13 and 14, for I can do everything with the help of Christ who gives me the strength I need. He is here to help me. Now, may he demand of me, yes, but when he demands of me, he enables me to do that. As Paul said, when he, he, he argued with some of the other ministers, he said, what are you boasting about what you've accomplished? If God had not given you the ability, you would have never been able to do it. So the thing is that I may accomplish great things, but it's only because God gives me strength to do that. So he enables me to do more than I could do on my own. Get it straight. God doesn't have a siphon hose sucking on our tank. We're the ones with the siphon hose. Now the bad part about dysfunctional relationships is you both got siphon hoses and neither one of you have more than an eighth of a tank. So you're never going to get anywhere. Best you can hope for is a quarter of a tank and then the other one's going to suck it right back. So whatever. But with God, we're empty, he's full, and we've got the siphon hose. And you know what he says? Come and take whatever you need without money, without price. That's the God that you and I serve. God doesn't seek to make us worthless, for we seem to have adequate ability to do that on our own. Now, in John chapter 3 and verse 16 through 18, the most familiar passage of Scripture, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whosoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. God didn't have to condemn us. We've already condemned ourselves. God does not seek to make us worthless, for we seem to have adequate ability to do that on our own. Any worthlessness we feel is self-inflicted because God came to reveal to us a worth so great that he was willing to send his son to redeem us. The woman at the well assumed Jesus was condemning her. We assume that God is condemning us, but he tells us in the most famous and well-known scripture of all is he did not come to condemn the world, but to save the world. As a matter of fact, at one point his disciples said, you can't do that, you can't die, you can't give your life. And he said, don't you realize for that very purpose came I into this world. I came to seek and to save that which was lost. 
God didn't make me lost. God didn't put me in my lostness. I was already there. Many times in our lives we are dropped, crumbled, and ground into dirt by the decisions we make and the circumstances that come our way. We feel as though we are worthless, but no matter what has happened or what will happen, we will never lose our value in God's eyes. Those on the white side of the page are the words of Joyce Myers. And what a powerful teacher of the gospel of Jesus Christ who has inspired so many women who struggle with worthlessness to understand that you are of incomprehensible worth to God. That's how much he loves us. T. Davis Bunn, author of some books that exalts Christianity and also an international economist, without God we are but bruised reeds ever threatened by the prospect of being crushed by life's uncaring millstone. Without God we are nothing, our lives worthless, our days an endless Circular tread. Without God we stand condemned, doomed to a life without the precious gift of hope. You see, God brings to us hope in our hopelessness. Broken things and broken people are the result of sin, yet God sent His Son to be broken that we might be healed. The truth of the matter is God has bigger plans for you than you have for yourself. Sorry, hit the wrong button. God has bigger plans for you than you have for yourself. Have we forgotten the words that he tells us in John chapter 10 and verse 10? I have come to give you life and to give you life more abundantly. So the problem isn't God. The problem is our perspective of God, our view of God. But when you understand God, when you understand his love and his compassion and his grace, understanding that there is nothing we can bring to the table we were worthless. And people say, but I don't want to be told that I'm worthless. I, 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 I'm, 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 I'm good. I'm good. I'm great. I'm really worth something. I'm not saying you're worthless. I'm just saying you could be of so much more worth when God comes and, and does this wonderful work of grace in your life. God never, I want you to get some straight. God never tells me I'm worthless. Even though I am. God never tells me I'm worthless. Quit, quit listening that that's coming from God. That's not from God. You're of such worth, he would give his son for you. You don't do that for something worthless. That's the value in you that you don't even recognize. Well, most of us, there are some people who seem to fully recognize their value. They just don't understand why everyone else doesn't understand their value. But the truth is, that's not most of us, if we're honest. Matter of fact, some of the people who seem the most arrogant are the most insecure and trying to cover it up with their bravado. I tried to put into words what God was speaking to my heart because I see so many people who are struggling with this thing of God and relationship and grace and mercy and love and compassion. Jesus didn't come to detract from my life but to add to it eternal significance, life and reward, not to mention a deep and abiding relationship of love and intimacy, intimacy with my creator. He also empowers me with his Holy Spirit to enable me to live a life I did not have the ability to live without it and all at great price. To him. Given to me without measure. Given to me by grace. Given to me by mercy. Given to me by compassion. Friends, that's the God that you and I serve. Here's what he says. The billionaire looks at you and says... Come and become mine, and we will be billionaires. Does God know I'm not a billionaire? Do y'all know I'm not a billionaire? Probably. If I am, I'm not even aware of it. But anyway, 
Okay, so God knows I'm not a billionaire, but he looks at me and he says, come with me and we will be billionaires. And that's a bad deal? I don't think that's a bad deal. And then and God comes with his love and his compassion. He says, I don't care how worthless you may see yourself. I don't see you that way. I see you as something so incredible and special and wonderful that I would die for you. Matter of fact, I did. I did. Lord Jesus, I thank you for your word. Even as our musicians come this morning, I thank you. Those that are going to be baptized, would you please head toward the baptistry right now? Friend, if you're here this morning and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and, and maybe, maybe you've listened to some of these voices that have, have, have told you who God is, but you need to understand who He is. For God so loved you. For God so loved you that He gave His Son to die. For you. For God so loved you that He gave His only begotten Son so that you need not perish. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ this morning, I I, I want to introduce you to Him. A worthless that little apostrophe he's my king and I'm the worthless one who has been made worthy who has been given worth by God a worth that he already has for me a worth that he already sees in me but, but pastor I'm not worth that You can't tell God that. Uh, God would never die for me. I'm sorry, he already has. And you just didn't know it. But today, somehow, if you're watching my live feed or recording, somehow today you've come to understand that Jesus died for you. Jesus died for me. Maybe you can walk away from that kind of love, but I couldn't. And one day, even as a little child, I understood his love, and I came to an altar, and I knelt down, and I cried, and I said, God, that kind of love, I can't turn away. If you're here in this place and you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, now with every, every head up and every eye watching, 